Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras, a change in America. I'm Monica Ortiz Uribe. The federal government is trying to reintroduce the Mexican gray wolf in New Mexico and Arizona. Humans nearly killed them off in the last century. After 16 years of trying, there are now 83 wolves in the wild. Thousands used to roam from central Mexico up through the southwest. To help boost the wolf population, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to substantially expand the area where wolves can roam. And it's a subject that often incites heated debate. And it's what we'll be talking about on today's show. My guests are Michael Robinson with the Center for Biological Diversity and Blair Dunn. He's an attorney who grew up on a ranch in Otero County. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so Michael, I want to start with you. Um, if you can help us understand uh, why the Fish and Wildlife has proposed this expansion, um, their proposal um, is to expand where wolves can ro roam um, 15 times in an area 15 times larger than what it is today. Um, can you tell us why? The Mexican gray wolf is the most endangered mammal in North America. It was persecuted until there were only seven animals left, and those animals were captured and used in the captive breeding program, an emergency effort to save it from extinction. But it hasn't worked, and scientists have pointed out to arbitrary, politically derived boundaries that the wolves are supposed to stay into, uh, stay within, uh, but that make no sense from a scientific point of view. So currently they're confined to the Gila National Forest near where I live, the Apache National Forest adjoining in Arizona, and the uh, adjoining Fort Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona as well. And scientists have long said they need much more room to roam so they can hunt, raise families, uh, raise their pups, and, uh, and contribute to the balance of nature and to saving them themselves from, from extinction. Makes no sense that when they cross from one national forest to another national forest or BLM public lands, that the government should be required to remove them and put them back. And unfortunately, this expansion is still has political boundaries, including that of Interstate 40. Scientists are now saying that to recover the Mexican wolf, they will have to be allowed to roam in areas such as the Grand Canyon ecosystem in northern Arizona and the southern Rocky Mountains in northern New Mexico. So and those areas would be off limits, unfortunately. So the boundaries um, under this proposal would be south of I-40, uh, right about where Albuquerque is, and Flagstaff in Arizona, um, and right up to the California and Texas borders and down to the Mexican border, correct? It sounds like there would be a lot of wolves, but in fact, the, uh, the sideboards on that would be somewhat draconian, and wolves would be removed for a variety of, of reasons, some perhaps valid and others perhaps a continuation of the old persecution that unfortunately the Mexican wolf has been so subject to. But well, and Maria, if I might add, you know, you started with the discussion of, of this as a species. One of the things that's really not quite settled is whether or not this really is a separate and distinct subspecies. Um, that's been the a subject. A separate and, su and, and, and distinct subspecies right, from? From the, from the rest of the gray wolves in Northern America. I see. Um, a program which has recovered and they are now proposing as part of the same process to delist that wolf. So one of the, the discussions is whether or not the science actually supports that this is a different species, or in fact, we already do have enough gray wolves and this isn't a different subspecies. So that's I one see. of the other discussions. So there's a population of wolves in, in the northern part of the country, but in the southern part here in the southwest, the population is a lot smaller. And, oh, go ahead. Well, and, and to that end, you know, part of the discussion, you discussed the area that we're um, going to be ex uh, potentially expanding to. One of the questions that isn't answered in order to be able to really evaluate whether or not um, the viability of the species, the impacts to the surrounding communities and to the industries is the number of wolves. That's not something the, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been really forthcoming with is what is the actual number of wolves in that area? Um, that's a, a really big question that really you have to understand before you can understand the impacts of having these wolves reintroduced As here. far as I understand, there are 83 wolves in, in the recovery, current recovery zone right. now. And so this proposal, um, the intent of it is to help grow the population. And to help grow the population, they say that the territory has to be expanded. And so let, let me just add um, and <coughs> elaborate a little bit <coughs> on, on what we just heard. There's been several scientific studies that have identified the Mexican gray wolf as a unique subspecies that's significantly different genetically and in terms of, of body shape, bone size, 
very, very subtle morphological gradations from the wolves in the, in the northern Rocky Mountains. So the Fish and Wildlife Service, thanks to a petition and a lawsuit by our organization, Center for Biological Diversity, is moving all too slowly towards the process of recognizing the, the worth and the, the, the uniqueness of this type of gray wolf that's smaller, has slightly different dentition, and that's adapted uniquely to our tiny corner of, of the world. So the count has shown 83 wolves in the last year with only five breeding pairs, which reflects their dire plight due to genetic inbreeding and mismanagement. Um, but scientists say that there has to be a lot more wolves than that in order for them to be viable, and that's what I think uh, we, we agree with. The Fish and Wildlife Service should have a recovery plan that says what's the goal. Okay, well, let's, uh, let, 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 let's sure. move on, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, uh, Blair, um, I there are people that live within the, the wolf recovery zone. Um, some of them are ranchers, and they're not very happy about the, the proposed expansion. Um, uh, why not? Really, the, the loss of the industry. One of the things that the industry is looking at is that if you do expand this population in number and in, in uh, size of the area, there's a good chance that you're going to wipe out the industry as a whole. Um, I think there's plenty of people that would argue that that is really the end game of this species is to push uh, livestock grazing off of public lands. And why does the, 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 the presence of the, of the wolf have such a detrimental effect? Can you explain it a little bit more? Well, it's really fairly common sense that wolves are going to eat the easiest thing to catch and uh, sheep and cattle are honestly what they're going to prey on first. Uh, especially, you know, we have concerns that um, wolves that are coming out of captivity that they may be, you know, normalized to humans, and and certainly uh, it, they're going to have a tendency to focus on on the human elements and to the, to the cattle and sheep industries more than they would, um, for instance, elk or deer. I mean, it's really pretty common sense which is going to be easier for them to catch and, and kill. And so I understand there is also a program uh, that uh, compensates ranchers when there is a confirmed um, killing of a cattle that, that is confirmed to be killed by a wolf. Right, and, and that's, that's a major source of contention in and of itself. Um, there's plenty of studies that point to the fact that only one in eight of the, of the potential confirmed kills is ever found to be a confirmed kill. Why so you're is talking that? That's th th those are the statistics that come from Fish and Wildlife as to what they do look at for what is a confirmed kill. Um, so y you have that, and if it's, a, if it's a confirmed kill, yeah, you do have compensation. If it's a non-confirmed kill, you're only looking at 50% compensation for what, um, what, what the loss is. So you're talking about out of eight, eight of your cows, seven and a half of them you're not going to be paid the full value for. And there's not many people that can operate on a, on a margin where you're losing 50% of your of your profit. Okay, yes, I, my, my next question was what, what, to what extent do the losses range for, uh, for ranchers? And you're saying it's about, on average... Uh, Seven and a half out of eight. That's I mean, that's, and, and it's, and 50% of that, so. Okay, okay, and so. I'm sorry. If you want to add, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I do want to address that. As somebody who lives uh, within half a mile of the Gila National Forest, I was lucky enough to hike in the Gila this morning and, and uh, see sign of, of bear right, right outside near where I, uh, where I live. Uh, there's, there's really a, a majority of people in this area who strongly support the Mexican wolves. That's been shown in a public survey be before the reintroduction began from the League of Women Voters that doesn't have a, a, uh, a horse in this race. And it's shown really in the increasing support that, uh, that we're seeing from people going to public hearings, speaking out, writing letters to the editor from, from this area. There's multiple spigots of money that are intended to address the very few and occasional losses of livestock to wolves. There's farm bill money that's provided. There's money through the Omnibus Lands Act of 2009 that's, that's provided. There's money that was uh, deposited in a special fund by Defenders of Wildlife, a nonprofit organization that's now under the control of the livestock industry through a so-called Stakeholders Council. So the very few losses that do take place have been addressed. The question is, are we going to be able to save this animal at the brink of extinction? My neighbors and my community here at the edge, or at the edge of the Gila very much want this this animal saved. There is a small minority that feels different. Um, to that end, you talk about a very small number. You're talking about increasing the number of wolves, so you're going to have an increased number of depredations. And to that end, what we're finding is that there really isn't adequate compensation. If you're if you're seven out of seven and a half out of your cow of your out of eight of your cows, you're not going to be fully compensated for. That's not a margin anybody can live with. You increase the number of wolves, and the science has also shown that we don't have the wildlife numbers to sustain larger populations. So let me, let me ask you this, Blair. Um, there is a, uh, a group called the Coexistence uh, Council uh, that tries to help r uh, ranchers uh, r avoid 
conflicts with wolves. Um, and some of the strategies they recommend uh, include having uh, range riders that put a human presence out in the pasture, um, flagging fences to visually deter wolves, and um, and keeping uh, cattle within the uh, within the ranch boundaries. Um, why don't more ranchers adopt these these uh, uh, these measures to protect their livestock, and and have they shown to work? Well, it, that's a very good question. One of the other things that's discussed, actually, in a, uni a University of Minnesota study from 1999, is guard dogs as another alternative. But what all of the studies have shown, and even one from here at NMSU with the Range Improvement Task Force, is that those measures really don't work. Why not? For a variety of reasons. Either the pack mentality of a wolf, you know, the way the cattle are operated, you know, the cost of those types of things. Those types of things do not work to prevent those depredations. And there have been, like I said, studies from here at NMSU and from elsewhere around the country for the people that are working on the wolf issue that say that those measures just aren't going to work, that ultimately you're still going to have livestock depredations. That also ties back to the type of wolf that they're turning out. Um, you're talking about captive bred wolves versus wild born wolves and you know what their tendencies are going to be with that kind of a background. Yeah, certainly. So it just doesn't really work. Um, when I was out uh, in, in reserve, um, I certainly spoke with people that had that concern. Um, uh, the wolf's behavior, whether it was a wild wolf behavior or a, a wolf that was more accustomed to, to humans. Um, I, I certainly spoke with a mother that uh, said she had a wolf pacing in front of her, um, her front porch. But um, I also went out to the Sevilleta uh, Wildlife Refuge and I got a chance to observe the captive wolves. And uh, they did show fear toward humans and they ran away. Um, and so I, I wonder then, um, uh, yeah, then, then what, what let is... Let me, if I could, another important component that the studies have shown and isn't pointed out, you, you mentioned a very good point that, you know, an adult human being very much may cause wolves. And if there is likely to be a human um, accident or fatality from this program, it will be children. And, you know, the loss of a child, I, I think, is, is far more uh, detrimental to communities and to families then, and they're the most likely people to be harmed by this, is children. And so, so far there haven't been any documented no. cases and, of and uh, let me Let me address that. Injuries. As somebody who's raising my family and animals at the edge of the Gila National Forest, uh, there's already risks. Uh, we ran into a Mojave rattlesnake uh, just this past, uh, the, a few days ago. And uh, one has to take normal common sense precautions. There's black bears we've seen. There are mountain lions, there's bobcats. Uh, there's poison ivy and there's cliffs and lightning. So common sense goes a long ways, but trying to scare people into opposing this vital program to rescue the Mexican gray wolf from extinction um, is, is really, that uh, doesn't really ad address the, the ways that people can get along with wolves. It's easy to say, oh, we can't do it. But scientists have repeatedly recommended that livestock owners be required to take some responsibility for rendering inedible, for example, uh, through lime, or uh, in areas with, with road access through a, a backhoe, the carcasses of livestock that die of non-wolf causes. They die of, of poisonous weeds, of birthing problems, of starvation during the drought years sometimes, of, of disease and other reasons. And wolves scavenge on them, and then they're more likely to focus on livestock. Okay. The, vast, the studies have shown, three separate scientific studies of these Mexican wolves, not speculative studies from other regions, uh, that Mr. Dunn is citing. Michael, that I have a. If, I, if I you can just let me finish sure. the sentence. The studies have shown uh, that that wolves are preying over 80 percent on elk. Most of the majority is deer, and only about two percent of what the, of what they're feeding on is livestock. That includes, in some cases, animals they scavenged on that had died of non-wolf causes. Yeah. So uh, there, there are well, other. Um, well, let me correct one ahead. thing right quick. Um, he's, he's talking about studies from outside the region. The Range Improvement Task Force, right here in New Mexico, at New Mexico State. Um, what Tech Report 78 has found that the very thing that he's talking about, the habitualization of wolves through, you know, non-wolf kills and, and the removal of carcasses is not a factor. That is not the way that is. It, it, what he's telling you isn't actually accurate. The studies have actually shown that that isn't a factor that, that, that contributes to this. It's not the removal of carcasses that's causing this. This happens without that. And the Range Improvement Task Force has, has actually done a study really that just contradicts exactly what he just said. That study was not in the field, it was, it was a model. 
Well, let's 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 move on, um, Michael. Tell me uh, why. So, so it seems that uh, there there is an obvious conflict um, uh, um, reintroducing the wolf and uh, and with with uh, with humans. And there there are those who support and say um, the the wolf should be reintroduced. Um, tell tell me why. Why is the wolf important? Uh, why go through all the trouble to to reintroduce uh, uh, this animal to this landscape? This, this unique Mexican gray wolf that's found nowhere else in the world but in the southwest and, and in the borderlands of Mexico where it's just been reintroduced is on, on the verge of extinction. Uh, and it plays a, a vital role in the balance of nature. It provides leftovers for uh, scavenging animals such as uh, badgers, eagles, bears. It helps, and this is based on studies in Yellowstone, it helps to limit the browsing of elk on the saplings of cottonwood trees along the streams. Keeps the elk moving so the trees have in Yellowstone have grown up bigger and now support nesting songbirds and are used by beavers that create dams that, that help the fish. In Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park and in the Midwest, there's been studies that show that wolves, paradoxically sounding, benefit pronghorn antelope and also foxes as well as uh, hares. Um, and the reason is because wolves uh, prey on coyotes. They see them as competitors and the coyotes heavily prey on the pronghorn fawns too small for, for wolves to, to seek out and hunt, but the, the coyotes do. So when the, when the uh, coyote numbers went down, the pronghorn numbers in Grand Teton National Park went up. Uh, same phenomenon in Yellowstone with fox numbers that went up as wolves uh, gained a foothold. And in the Midwest, hares also got some respite from uh, predation from coyotes. So it raises the question, how many other interactions in the natural world are there where this pivotal top level carnivore that's so important to the balance of nature uh, is holding things together. And do we really have the wisdom to exterminate it from the face of the earth? And should we be doing it for a special interest group that isn't seeking to get along? So let, let me, go if ahead, I might. Go ahead. Um, first big problem is the same one we talked about. This isn't a separate and sub distinct subspecies. It's, it, it's not. So you have those. He's citing to these wolf studies from other places. Those are the same wolves. That's the first problem. The next is that if, if they were really going to be honest with us, his last comment there was what this is really about. It's about removing grazing from these lands. They do not want to have that interaction. Because you can cite all the studies you want to about pronghorn and, and whatever else, but the fact of the matter is at the end of the day, if there are cattle on the ground, that's what the wolf is going to eat first, before well, any of the rest of those species. I mean, and, and if you're going to put those on the ground, you're not going to have those benefits to the ecosystem that they're talking about. All you're going to be doing is removing cattle. So, uh, so the, the ranchers uh, um, choose to, to ranch on this, on this land and, and, and lease it um, uh, from the federal government. Um, they, they have to live with other predators, um, including uh, mountain lions and bears. So why shouldn't they also um, live with the wolf? Um, you know, th there's an argument that they can be. But if you're going to reintroduce something that's going to cause a, a harm and a cost to the industry that isn't necessarily something that, that needs to be on the landscape where it is, they need to be compensated for that. In some instances, for instance, in northern New Mexico, where they do see uh, a w wolves occasionally, we've had reports of them up there, um, there are people that have been there for 500 years and ranching there for 500 years. Their sheep and cattle have been there that long. We have ecosystems that are working. Um, we have a game department that manages for wildlife and, and those different predators and those different things. We have a system that's working. This is a reintroduction. This is a, a placing an apex predator back onto the landscape that hasn't been there for quite a long time. Um, and the costs to that are what, are what is the big discussion. Um, you talk about wiping out part of New Mexico's economy. In 19, I think it was 1918, um, 40 to 50 wolves on the landscape in New Mexico cost in 2007 dollars about a million dollars for one year. That's livestock a losses. Dollars a million dollars a year for a livestock loss. In New Mexico, the livestock industry is roughly a 1.8 billion dollar industry. This is a, a big part of people's lives. These are people's livelihoods. This is their culture. And it's an important part of things. And yes, there is a human risk to this involved too. I mean, we can talk about, you know, worrying about poison ivy or falling off a cliff, but this is introducing a new risk. This is a, a risk to children that isn't there before. And what is the benefit 
to actually introducing this predator back into the wildlife. I mean, he talks about the ecosystem, but we know that that ecosystem he's discussing is one that doesn't have cattle on it. So you have to wipe the cattle off in order to have those kind of benefits that he's discussing. And that is just really not acceptable to the cattle industry, to the sheep industry, and it really shouldn't be acceptable to most people that, that depend on agriculture for their food, which we all do. Well, Michael, can, can cattle and, and wolves coexist on the same landscape? They're coexisting in the northern Rocky Mountains. They're coexisting in the Midwest, which has uh, thousands of wolves in the states of Min Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, and Michigan. In fact, there's even thousands of years, uh, thousands of wolves in the heavy, heavily settled continent of Europe. So it's a matter of people trying to get along. And uh, Mr. Dunn has, uh, was the uh, attorney for a group of uh, livestock owners who were, I think it was the third lawsuit seeking removal and destruction of the wolves. There's been a fourth since. Each one of these lawsuits has been dismissed because it doesn't fulfill the noble purposes of the Endangered Species Act, which is not to exterminate animals. We did that already with so many animals. Uh, so many landscapes have been cleaned of, of so much wildlife. It's instead to bring back some small piece of the balance. And the Mexican wolf is integral to the health of the natural ecosystems. I think that we can have coexistence, but if we keep hearing no, 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 if we keep getting more lawsuits demanding that the government shoot and trap the wolves, then we'll never have a chance to test whether we can do as well as Minnesota, Idaho, Montana, and other places where there are problems, there are conflicts, but in some cases people are really making good faith efforts to try and make it work together. Well, we would, can try that here. Would so there be an let idea? Me, let me correct the record first. Um, I wasn't involved in that lawsuit. Uh, that wasn't a lawsuit that I participated in. I'd, I'd rather not, you know, right, I, I, there like are plenty that. of lawsuits Never I'm involved in. No, actually, I, I haven't been on a wolf, a wolf lawsuit yet. Um, okay. Plenty oh, of other I, endangered I, species, I but not that one. Sure. Um, but the one Im important point to all of this is, is still that th those costs to these people are, are, are not being weighed out. And if you're going to come up with a plan, my, my point is this, you need to be talking about recovery. And in the current proposal, they don't say we're not discussing. They don't say full recovery. They say we're going to do this in part. And you're asking people to take on this faith that that's where that's going. Recovery of, 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 the of, the of the wolf pro pro uh, program right here. Okay. okay. There's, well, there's no there's some common ground. We, we agree we need a recovery plan. Absolutely. We need to have the best science on the table so that, so that things can, you know, are not, not a matter of just barely saving the species from extinction at the last moment, but careful planning to make sure it can, it can recover along with the human communities. I'm part of one of those communities. There's another so that, 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 that would be um, uh, uh, my question. Is, is, there, is there a middle ground? Um, is, it, is it a question of abandoning for, um, for ranchers who are suffering these losses um, and fear for their future? Um, is it a matter of, of abandoning the, the, the effort to recover the wolf? Or is there a, a management plan that, the, um, that ranchers can, uh, can agree with and live with? So, great question. Um, I would phrase it this way, if, if we put aside the, the, pro the problems that people have with whether or not this is actually a separate subspecies, and you look at what's worked in those other states, in the Midwestern states and in the w other Western states to the north of us, those have been state-run programs, and I believe if you, if you, if you are going to do it, it needs to be something that does focus on local control and lo focuses on a state management. They've had great success with this species, up no the same species up north. If you're going to do it, it needs to be something that we're managing here at home, locally so that people, so that we can take into account these communities and we can take into account the different industries and the different impacts to the state and the different impacts to the wildlife that the, that the state manages. If we're going to do it, there may be a, a path forward to do it, but it needs to be one that generates from here and not out of a federal agency and, and without much in the way of local input. And, and it needs to be with some honesty. I mean, if, and if, if wait, the US me, Fish and Wildlife I, I Service I, was I, managing I, the wolves in Northern I, I apologize when I interrupted you earlier. I'd ask that you let me do, do the same without interrupting me. Um, this, a, go ahead. well, let's just move on. The That's US right. Fish and Wildlife Service did recover the wolves in the upper Midwest and did bring the population to, re to um, significant levels before they were delisted by Congress in the Northern Rocky Mountains. This Those is the United States, not state control. The reason the Endangered Species Act is a federal law is because parochial interests, if you'll excuse me, including the livestock industry, have exerted so much control that entire ecosystems are unraveling as their species uh, disappear and dwindle towards extinction. That doesn't work for the American public. Those need were some state balance. managed programs. Is there a recovery plan um, that, that ranchers could support? in terms of recovering the and, and, and growing the, the A true population. recovery plan? I think the ranchers would, would be interested in looking at that, but you are going to have to compensate people include? for their losses, for the loss of their property. 
Um, that's one of the main things, is really, truly adequate compensation for the loss of these ranchers. If, if our goal is, to, is to, gr to grow wolves and to raise wolves, and their food, food source is going to be the cattle industry, those people need to be compensated for that. But at, the, but at the heart of this, I really have to go back to what, what I was going to say before he interrupted me. We need some honesty on both sides before that happens. We need honesty from the, the we'll call it the pro-wolf side of things, that this really is about the wolf and it's not about removing grazing from federal, from federal lands. Because a lot of what we hear is very much this, well, we're going to remove the welfare ranchers off of federal lands. That is absolutely not a good place to start from. And when that is what the real true motivation of this stuff is, which is what everybody in, in the cattle industry and the sheep industry understands, you ask about a recovery plan, it can't be focused on removing cattle from the landscape. What would, you, what would you respond to? Is this an effort to, to remove uh, um, cattle from, from the land? The Mexican wolf has been on the ground in the Gila and Apache National Forest now for 16 years. And uh, the livestock industry is still there. There's still, there's still livestock, uh, including in places in the Gila National Forest where livestock are banned, unfortunately. There's, still, there's even trespass livestock. So the, the livestock industry is, is still there. We have multiple spigots of money, as I said before, farm bill money. Uh, the Omnibus Lands Act money, all dedicated uh, to, to reimbursing life, the livestock industry for the very rare losses, as well as the new Coexistence Council, which b has been vested with money from a private nonprofit organization, as well as from, from other sources. So how many, how many new spigots of, of money have to be opened up until we finally get an okay from this industry that feels that it should be monopolizing the public lands. So we have time to, uh, to make uh, um, uh, one more comment from, from both of you, so I'll ask you to okay. make it short. 1915 to 1920, the estimated cost in 2007 uh, dollars is $9.4 million in, in that period of time. If we're going to talk about the amount of money that it's going to take, it, what he's discussing are pennies on the dollar of what it needs to be. So then the question goes back to the general public. If this is what you want, how much are you really willing to pay for it? And are you willing to sacrifice so that you're going to pay at the grocery stores more for the food that you're consuming now? Part of what we enjoy in this country is a surplus of yeah. food, and it's very important that we keep those types of things open and available. Michael. The Mexican gray wolf is a beautiful, intelligent social animal on the, on the brink of extinction because of mismanagement and politicized management. It needs more room to roam. It needs for genetic integrity to, be, uh, to allow for releases to be allowed here in New Mexico. There already is compensation. A hundred years ago, there were few or none deer or elk in most of these landscapes. Now there's deer and elk. That's most, most of the wolves uh, are eating and they can thrive and we can coexist. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen, for, you. for coming on the show. This has been Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Monica Ortiz Uribe.